Now let's talk about it. So to begin FlyQ, you simply tap on the FlyQ icon. You may have two different FlyQ icons on your screen. A lot of people do. If so, make sure that you pick the one which is Magenta, the one that says FlyQ EFB. FlyQ Insight uh, doesn't have the moving map. It's our free version. So I'm tapping on the Magenta icon right now. This is FlyQ EFB. This is, by the way, the currently shipping version, version 4.0.1 the one that we released in, uh, I think, late September. So I, I will be using this for the presentations up until uh, Thursday when I begin switching to version 4.5. So I'm going to show you some things today, but I'm going to stop it at a certain point because I want to have a, a break. I don't want to go too fast for the intro to flight planning part. We'll have another presentation. Um, I believe it's on Wednesday, I think, which talks about um, advanced flight planning. The more advanced one will talk about things like uh, using search and rescue grids, uh, using ATC recently cleared routes, some of the more advanced things. Today, we'll try to keep it a little bit simpler. But in all events, what we're going to be having is uh, probably not as much information as you like in some cases. You probably want more or you'll forget some things. So I'm going to give you a couple of tips on remembering things using the product. The first thing to do is, at the top of the screen in FlyQ, there are a number of buttons. You've probably used them before. The ones that say search for airports, the one that looks like a padlock, and so on. Towards the middle of that bar at the top of the screen, right above where it says 44.4 nautical miles to waypoint, is a button that looks like a gear. That's our settings screen. I'm going to show you how to get more information through settings. So I'm going to tap that gear icon, tap there. And the first category is not actually settings, it's more giving you some help information. And the second item down is all about technical support or help. I'm gonna tap on that choice, and that pops up a series of different things that you can look at. One of them is videos. So I'm gonna tap on videos, and that'll bring you to the YouTube channel that we have um, well, on YouTube. You can also get to this using any web browser on a Mac or a PC or even the iPad, simply by going to youtube.com slash flyq efb no spaces very straightforward and very simple what's nice about the web page um whether you're getting at it directly from using uh, you know chrome or safari or edge or whatever you're using or through flyq efb is that we have 80 plus videos here for example these videos here in the middle of the screen the ones that say seven day challenge those are probably the ones that i'd recommend you take a look at first if you haven't if you're new to the product Begin with the one called the basics, uh, the first one. As you can see, all of these are about five to 10 minutes long, generally speaking. The, what we'll be talking about today is something like what's in the flight planning video, which is on towards the top of your screen on the right-hand side. We'll also touch a little bit on weather, um, and then probably in the more advanced session, we'll talk about flight planning combined with some of the IFR things as well, and then so on. So again, if you forget what we're talking about today or want to see some more details, be able to pause a pre-recorded presentation and so on. Just hit the settings icon. I'm going to go back to Fly QEFB now by hitting in the very uh, upper left corner of the screen on with the newer versions of the Apple operating system. You can tap that and it goes back to the app you were just using. So that'll bring me back to Fly Q and I will hit the close button. One other thing though asking for help that I think is useful. I'm going to hit done now. At the bottom of the screen, we have a series of tabs. On the far right is documents. My documents is very, very full because we use it for a lot of testing. Yours probably will have two items in it unless you've added some. Those two items would be the pilot's guide that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, the one with the magenta icon of FlyQ itself. And then next to the guy <laughs> with a bicycle helmet on, um, you see something that says sectional and tech charts. That's a very useful thing. That gives you uh, the legend to what the sectionals look like. But in terms of finding out more about flight planning, tap on the pilot's guide. And the neat thing here is there's a little, you can change pages very simply. A lot of different ways that you can do this. I'm going to hit the button that looks like um, four squares towards the upper left corner. And I'm just going to use that to kind of scroll back to the beginning. If you go back to the table of contents, for example, here, you can actually click on any of these things that are live. So I'm going to flip to the pages here. And if you take, this is page four of the uh, document that talks about the pilot's guide. Towards the bottom of it, it says flight plans, creating a flight plan, loading a previously created flight plan, and so on. If you tap on any of those, 
I'll jump right to that point. So I just tapped on the point that said creating a flight plan and it automatically goes to the right page. So much of what I'm going to be talking to you about here today is covered in this material if you forget some of it. Okay, so without further ado, let's actually start creating some flight plans. Let's go to the map. Now, in FlyQ EFB, there are fundamentally two ways, maybe three different ways of creating a flight plan. The way that I think most people begin doing it is the way that I'm going to start today. And that's simply to take a look at the search box in the upper left corner of the screen, the one that says search for airports. That's a little bit misleading. It is usually used to search for airports, but you can also use it to create an entire flight plan. So for example, if I want to take a flight from my home airport, the ident for that being PAE, you can type the K by the way, if you want to, you can type in KPAE if you choose, but it's not required. And I want to go from PAE down to SFO, which is San Francisco, and hit the blue search button on my keyboard and go. The system will create a flight plan and depending on which parameters I've given it, by default, it'll plan it on Victor Airways. It will wind optimize the flight plan for me. And if the distance requires it, it will create a, a fuel stop for me. And it looks like what it did. So it created a fuel stop. You see an airport in the middle of my flight after the, uh, let's call it the Oregon fix, is an ident for an airport, three Sierra eight right there. Presumably that's a fuel stop. In fact, if you look at the nav log, you can see it's adding 35.5 gallons of fuel on that uh, line that has the magenta icon on it. So we're adding fuel and it did that all by itself, all automatically, simply by typing in two different idents. So what else can you do? That's a very simple way to do it. You can be a lot more sophisticated though. For example, I'm gonna go back to that search on top. I'll hit the uh, gray X declare that. And let's say they want to do a flight, uh, something a little bit different. Based on the time of day, I'm not quite sure where we may be. But let's say um, you're sitting in the East Coast right now. I want to do a flight from Boston to, I don't know, where AOPA is located, FDK. Uh, actually, let's try it, that again. Let's, let's say that I want to go from Boston to Miami, which would be MIA, but I want to stop at AOPA's home headquarters, which is FDK. So I'll type FDK, then Miami. Then I'll hit the search button again, and it'll plan the flight out from Boston to FDK, Fredericks, down to Miami. If I don't, well, except I made it a little bit too challenging for it, okay? I guess I set the aircraft uh, altitudes incorrectly to do that in my own setup. So let's try something a little bit simpler. Let's go PAE, PDX, down to SFO. So it's now creating the flight plan, not just between two points, but between three points, it's including PDX. And then here's the flight plan. Notice that it landed at the airport at PDX. Now it's an interesting thing, right? Because PDX could be either a nav aid, it's a three letter ident, or it could be an airport. Well, in this particular case, there actually happens to be no ident uh, called PDX. So that's a little bit unfair. But normally if you were to type in something that is both an ident and a nav aid, the system tries to be smart. What it tries to do is the first item and the last item, it assumes are airports, unless otherwise told. But once in the middle, it has to be a little bit more precise. Let me try this again. I'll, I'll give you a different example. I'll type in Payne, which is north of Seattle, then SEA, then we'll go down to PDX. So a very short flight. Now in this case, SEA happens to be both a nav aid and an airport. So let's see what the system does while creating this flight plan. Notice what it did. If you look down the screen, if you look down the nav log, we begin at an airport, Payne. We went to, since we're flying on Victor's, we jumped on at the Payne VOR. Then it flew to the Seattle VOR, not the Seattle airport. The reason for that, again, is because I put something in the middle that could have been either a nav aid or an airport. If it's in the middle, and if you don't put the K in, it will assume that it's a nav aid. Okay, relatively clear. Hopefully this may go a little bit fast, but I'm gonna to try to keep this relatively straightforward. Let's try something a little bit different. Try something a little bit more sophisticated. If I want to go again from pain down to, oh, okay, let's say PDX again. 
if I just type that in, it will use my default routing method, which the default system in FlyIQ is to plan it on Victor Airways. But if you just want to go point to point, just go PAE to PDX, nothing in the middle. I'll take it from there. I just want to go direct. You can put another space. And we have a number of different uh, directives that you can add, one letter uh, that you can use. Like if I did want to plan this and force it to be planned on Victor's, I could put a V. They'll plan it on Victor Airways. Or if I was flying a jet, I could put a J, plan it on Jet Airways. Or in this case, I'm putting an N. N means nothing. It means no routing, just go point to point, PAE, PDX, no fuss, no mess. I hit search, and it should create the slide plan rather rapidly because it's just two points, okay? So there are a number of, uh, of those in the system. In fact, I'm gonna go back to my documents here. And inside here, conveniently, in the pilot's guide, it talks about those. This is page 77 of the pilot's guide. V for victors, J for jet, G for what we, we used to call this GPS track. They'll get you there with train avoidance. N for no routing. W is a good one. W will get, well, it won't do any routing, but it will wind optimize and it will add fuel stops. So if I typed in, for example, PAE, SFO, W, it would, wouldn't add any other waypoints in the middle, but it would give me the right altitude. And if necessary, it would add a fuel stop for me. Then the final one is I, meaning I want to guarantee that this is done as an IFR flight, look at ATC routes and so on. We'll talk about that one later. But just remember that if you don't remember those magic letters at the end, you don't really have to remember them. You can just look them up in the pilot's guide. It's page 177. Okay, so back to the plans tab. So now we have the plans on the screen. So what do we do? Well, a couple of things. One thing I want to point out is, I, uh, I'm not sure if you could see it from the very brief screenshot that you got of me, or the video shot you got of me, but I'm 52 years old and I wear reading glasses when I you know, read, or if I'm flying and I'm looking at the screen, not looking outside the cockpit. So if that is something that sounds familiar to you, know that you can change the font size here, the Navlog. So the Navlog fonts aren't tiny, but if you want to make them bigger, above where it has a route uh, towards the middle of the screen, there's a little letter A, then the words wind optimizer, then reverse, then clear, then edit. The little a and the big a, if you tap that, that changes the font size. And as you can see, it makes it very dramatically bigger, much, much easier to see. All right, now let's try actually modifying the flight plan. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I'm gonna do it in a few different of, of those ways. The easiest though is to usually to rubber band the flight plan. So to do that, I'm going to go down to my maps tab, just select that. I see my flight, I'm just pinching it out a little bit. Okay, and let's modify it. The way that you modify it on, flight, on FlyQ is pretty straightforward. You, if you select an existing point, and there are only two of them, so this doesn't really apply, or if you press and hold anywhere on the magenta line, which is your flight plan line, you can modify it. So I'm going to press and hold for about two seconds, move that to another point. I don't have to score a direct hit. What the system does is it says, okay, you approximately hit this point right here. So it gives me a couple of choices. First thing is, it just shows me the exact latitude and longitude. Now, if you literally want to go to that point, and I'll show you a reason why you may want to do that later, you don't have to hit plus WPT. Some people do that to create a per plus WPT means add personal waypoint. You don't have to do that. You would only create a personal waypoint if you want to use that exact location again. If this is a one-time use thing, you just tap anywhere in the part that says North 46, 58, and so on. Okay, that's for, and that's, and I'll show you an example of why you'd want to do that in a little bit. Or if you look down, you see Olympia Regional Airport. Now, something to understand here is we're looking at um, airports and nav aids only. If you take a look at the bottom of that pop-up list, there's something that says common, which is white, and then airports, nav aids, and fixes. Common means you see airports and nav aids combined together. So if I scroll down this a little bit, you see both the Olympia Airport and the Olympia nav aid. But you could scroll this all day and you're not gonna find any fixes. Why? Because there's so darn many uh, fixes that it just make a big mess. You'd never find the airports. So if you specifically do wanna to fly to a fix, if you're flying especially IFR, you wanna hit the tab at the bottom that's on the far right. So it's common, airports, nav aids, and then fixes right there and that will show you fixes in the area, and then just tap on them. 
I don't though. In this particular case, I'm just gonna fly to the Olympia nav aid. So anywhere here where OLM, other than hitting the I or the map, if I tap anywhere else in that cell, it locks to that point. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and let's modify it again a little bit more with rubber banding. If I decide that I want to move that point to somewhere else, for example, um, let's say that I want to do some sightseeing and I want to see the water. There's an airport directly to the west, right on the water there, uh, called Bowerman Field HQM Hoquiam. So what I can do is I'm gonna press and hold on the Olympia icon and now move that to Hoquiam, pick the airport by tapping anywhere in that cell, and boom, that's done. So you can either move an existing nav aid or an existing point like that, or if you tap and press and hold within uh, the line itself, not on a given point, you rubber band it to create a new point. Also, if you decide, you know, the weather is really bad, so maybe I don't really want to fly to Hoquiam today, I just want to go direct, and I want to delete that point, a couple ways to do it. You could do it by going to your plans tab, clicking here and deleting it from the nav log, or the faster way is just to stay on the map page, press and hold as we did before, then release. And when you release, it shows you the nav aids in the vicinity like that airport, like Hoquiam, but it also in the upper right corner of the pop-up has a delete button. So I'm going to tap on delete and poof, it goes away and there's the rest of our flight plan. Okay, so rubber banding the flight plan is pretty straightforward. There are other ways of doing it too, for example, if you're looking around at these, let's put the fuel layer on, for example. Um, let's say that I may need fuel. I tap the layers pop up, and on, in the other category, three down below the flight plan is fuel prices. So let's say, remember in FlyQ, green is good, red is bad. I see a lot of bad. That's unfortunate. Uh, I was hoping for something green. All right, well, for whatever reason, let's say that we wanted to get some $5 of fuel right before landing at PDX, because at PDX, it looks like it's gonna be about 535. So if you want to do that, again, you can just drag and drop to that point, look at what airport is near there, pick, go, done, okay? So now the question is, how does it know that I really want to add fuel there? Ah, this is where it becomes just a little bit more interesting. So to tell it that you don't just wanna fly over it, but you want to stop there, it's a little more complicated. You go to the plans tab, which is the one immediately to the right of the map. I pick that. And notice that the airport that we added is now there. That's the second airport, KSPB. So how do I make it a fuel stop? If you take a look at the, the nav log here, you can see that we are in fact not adding any fuel. You see, by the way, let's uh, talk a little bit about how to read the nav log. So in the nav log, the top item is pane, then you see 7,500, then an ETE. 7,500 refers to at the end of the leg between pain and the next point, in this case, KSPB, you will be flying at 7,500 feet. So the altitude here is where you are at the end of that leg, not the start of the leg, just to be clear. The ETE is telling us that it's gonna take about one hour and 22 minutes to fly between KPAE and KSPB. Our heading is about as due south as you can get, magnetic heading, wind speed, distance, ground speed, et cetera. And in the column in the middle, there are a couple of fuel columns. Once it's fuel added, the aircraft that we're flying today um, has, a, has a 53 gallons of usable fuel. So by default, the system adds the default, uh, rather it adds full usable fuel. It tells me how much fuel is going to be burned between going between KPAE and our first fuel stop and then therefore how much fuel is remaining. So if I wanted to, for whatever reason, at KSPB add more fuel, here's how you do it. You tap the green edit button, that's why we made it highlighted a different color. You tap the green button, and then for KSPB, you tap anywhere in the entire row. You don't have to be precise about it, other than don't hit the minus sign, the minus sign will delete it. But if you hit anywhere else, you tap here, and it pops up that airport. So you see it's ident, the altitude at the end of the leg, how much fuel is added? Wait, okay, that's what we wanna do. We wanna put some fuel in. So we tap into that cell, and since it thinks right now we're simply flying over it, not landing, it says, well, do you wanna make it a fuel stop? Because otherwise, 
unless you're flying a fighter plane for the uh, Air Force, you can't do mid-air refueling. So I will say, yes, make it a fuel stop. Notice the type right below the fuel added suddenly changed to stop. And now I'm going to type in the value, say maybe 10 gallons. A couple of other things there. You can type in a layover time. Uh, so if you were going to be on the ground for 30 minutes, you can type that in. If you're going to be on the ground for two hours because you want to get lunch, you can type that in. And then there's a handy thing here too, that if you did want to change the altitude, which is the second point right below the ident, if you wanted to change the altitude, you can change the altitude. Let's say that you had a much longer flight plan, one that had 20 points in it. You could change the altitude for just the waypoint you were looking at, or this one and all the waypoints below it, or even change the altitude for all the waypoints in your entire flight plan. Very handy feature. Anyway, we'll just keep it to wait this one. So at this point, we've changed it, we've added it a fuel stop. All that we have to do to commit to change is to click on what used to be the green edit button is now the green done button, uh, roughly in the middle of the screen. So I'll click on done, and that changes. And if we scroll over, we see that in fact, we have fuel added 53 gallons at takeoff, and then at our fuel stop, we add exactly 10.0 gallons. Okay. So that's how you add a fuel stop to the system. Pretty straightforward. We can go back to the map and you see that on the screen. Other things that you can do with this, let's talk about other ways of adding uh, flights, adding a waypoint, for example. Let's, and these are not as commonly used, to be honest with you. But let's say that we were flying along here and we don't, for whatever reason, we don't feel like rubber banding. We just feel like double tapping on an airport. Like, say that we were interested in going to Mount Rainier. So we want to land an airport reasonably close to Mount Rainier in the middle of the screen. Well, I can double tap. There's an airport now that I put in the middle. If I double tap here, it's a 21 Whiskey, Ranger Creek. If I didn't feel like rubber banding to it, I can hit the button, not that says Direct 2, not the Direct 2 symbol, but the one next to that, immediately to the right, it says plus FP. Plus FP means add to flight plan. So I tap there, and it says, great. Where would you like to insert it above? So for example, if I wanted to change my flight plan to take off from that airport, then fly to Payne, I would tap on KPAE. I don't though. What I want to do is I want to uh, fly there before I get to KSPB. So I will tap on KSPB. I'll do that in a second. But if you wanted to extend the flight plan to add another airport after your existing landing point, you tap the blue text that says add to end. But that's not what I want to do. So I'm going to tap KSPB. And there it goes. And our flight plan line is there. So those are a couple of different ways that you can create a flight plan. I think the vast majority of the time, about the easiest thing to do is to create um, either one on Victor Airways, um, if you're flying on Victor's, or to do one that's essentially point to point and then rubber band it as you like. Now, you can rubber band it. Before I talked about rubber banding it to locking it to a waypoint, but I said that sometimes you're going to want to get it locked to just some random point in space. So what's an example of that? Well, let's take a look. Let's say that, um, let's take a look at what the weather is like. So I'm going to turn on the radar layer. Okay. The radar layer, I'm going to describe in technical terms as yucky. So if I want to get outside of this radar, well, it's fundamentally impossible. But let's say they want to try a little bit. So what I want to do is I want to fly somewhere just to the east of some of the radar echoes into a little bit of a gap there. So I'm going to grab on that point that I used earlier and drag it to this point where maybe at least for a few moments, I will have no radar echoes. So I'm going to drag and drop here. I'm not flying over a nav aid. I'm not flying over a fix or anything like that. I just literally want to fly to random latitude, longitude, and space. To do that, I tap somewhere in the box on top that says North 46, 48, 16.3. Don't tap on the plus WPT button unless like you wanted this, let's say that you uh, rubber banded it over your house and you want to create a waypoint name my house or something like that. But if you just want for one time use to create it, Simply tap somewhere in it, click, go, done. Now, if you go back to the plans tab at the bottom of the screen and look at it, you see a random latitude longitude. It's now part of your flight plan. Okay. So that's one way of editing. That's uh, one way that people do flight plans. 
while we're on the Navlog screen here, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you can change. Anything that's blue and underline, anything that's blue on a web page usually means it's a hyperlink thing, something you can click. Same thing applies here. So if you take a look at the screen beginning at the upper left corner, if you want to go back to your plans, you hit the plans button. If you want to rename my flight plan, so the system defaults to using the takeoff and landing airport. And then if you've done a lot of them, like in this case, 72 of them, it adds a number to the end. So if I want to rename that, I can simply tap on that and say, can hit the backspace button on my keyboard and type something like Monday flight. Hit the change button. And now the name of the flight plan is Monday flight. If you have more than one pilot in your system, uh, you can change it from Todd Podrachik to whoever else you like. So you tap there and it pulls up a list of other pilots. If you want to change the takeoff time, the system, you can set in defaults, and I'll show you how to do that in a little while. You can tell it by default if you use the search button uh, to create a flight plan, how far into the future to use to create the flight plan. By default, I believe it's an hour, but you can configure it. Let's say, though, that I wanted to fly tonight, but not at 6.15. I wanted to fly at maybe 9 o'clock tonight because I wanted to make sure I watched all the Monday night football. So I'll tap somewhere on the time. And then I get a picker. I just scroll the wheels down to nine, zero, zero, and tap off it. Oh, sorry about that. Um, nine. Even I made a mistake there. After I select nine, zero, zero, you notice just below there, there's a button that says change and a button that says cancel just like renaming the flight. So make sure to hit the change button. And now it's at nine o'clock. If you were to do this far enough in the future, you'd see that the wind direction, the wind speed, all of that, um, even the fuel consumption changes automatically with it. So it's pretty slick. But at this point, we now have a flight that's planned a little bit later. If you, instead of flying VFR, you are going to instead fly IFR, you can tap on the part that says type colon, then a blue VFR. And I'll pick IFR. Notice that the altitudes change. So now we're at 7,000, 9,000, 7,000. Make this guy VFR. And what do you know? The altitudes are actually in 500 foot increments as they ought to be. Uh, the altitudes are also computed to be correct for cardinal altitudes, depending on direction of flight and so on. So they should always be correct. And you can pick, uh, if you have more than one plane in your system, you can type on, you can tap on that and pick whatever plane you want as well. Okay, so there's a lot of things that you can do here. Also, one of the best parts about this is if you have something like a Dynon Skyview, um, a, uh, AF, an advanced flight systems system, or you have an Avidyne IFD, you can take this flight plan and send it to your in-panel display. Pretty slick and really simple. All that you do is in the upper right corner of the screen, there's a button that looks like a box with an arrow coming out. That's the Apple symbol generally used in all iPad and iPhone stuff to mean do something or send it or share it. So that's what we're doing. We want to share this flight plan with our, let's say, the Avidyne IFD. So I tap that point here. First thing you can do is you can email it, print it, or save it to documents. It's not giving me the option to send it to the IFD. The reason for that is pretty straightforward. It knows I'm not connected to an IFD, but that's the same button that you would hit. You can also use it though, as I said, to email it or print it. So if you were, for example, to email the document to somebody, so take that, take a look what you get. You get a printed nav log, you get your ICAO flight plan, all of that created as a PDF. You can send that to whomever you like. I'll just hit send. And if I were to check my email later, it would be there. So you have, if you have a co-pilot or a loved one or something like that, you can send them your flight plan doing that, or you can print it out. Or again, if you have a Skyview or an AFS system or an IFD, you can send it to them as well. Very easy to do. All right, let's talk a little bit more about how you can create a flight plan. Uh, there's a little bit more details there. Uh, oh, actually, I take that back. First, let's talk about what you get when you create a flight plan. Obviously, you can get a nav log, and you saw what that looks like. That was what was on the screen before. You can get a printed nav log. But you can also get a weather briefing, and it could not possibly be any simpler. If I tap on the WX Brief tab right in the middle of the screen, my weather briefing has already been created for me. I didn't have to ask for it. It does that automatically 
for you. Very simple and very easy to do. If you want to file that flight plan, also simple. You pick the tab next to WRX Brief that says IKO plan. Now, there's a list of items here like time and cruise speed. Again, this is the IKO plan. Um, route of flight, notice that's latitude, longitude in there. If you want to file this flight plan, it's incredibly simple. You simply tap the file button, which is a blue word file right below the word navlog towards top-ish on the left side. So tap on that, and there you go. We've now filed this flight plan. Uh, we, did a, we ended up doing it as a VFR plan. So it's a VFR plan. All of the information is there, ready to go. And here's a cool thing too, that if you want to make absolute, we're, by the way, we filed the flight plans through LATOS, 1-800-WX-BRIEF. If you want to make sure that you have a copy of that in case there's some kind of a weird problem, remember that a button I told you about before that sends things, the one with the box with the arrow? If you take a look at this pop-up, there's a closed button on the left-hand side, but on the top right side, there's that same icon. So if we tap that same icon, the box of the arrow in it, we again have a choice to email it, to print it, or save it to documents. Ah, so I'm gonna save this to documents. It's asking me where, I've created lots of folders in the system. Um, so all my flights, for example, from PAE, I can put in the pain folder by typing P by tapping on the PAE icon. Now, when I close this, if I go to my documents folder at the bottom, hit the done button here to get out of the pilot's guide. And we go up to the top here, you'll notice that I created a folder uh, called My Flights. I think that's where it was, um, or airports rather. So airports, then you go to PAE and you see the flight plan that was just created. So there you go. So the flight plan that I just created and filed is now stored on my computer in case anybody has any question. And of course, there's a print icon and an email icon there as well. So you can print it out, email it, whatever you need to do. So that's a very, very handy thing to be able to do with the system. So let's go back to plans. So that's what you more or less do here in terms of using a plan once it's been created. But there's a lot of other ways to create the flight plan. I'm not going to go into every single detail here because there's a lot, but I want to show you a couple of things. One is how you set up your own defaults. So the search box, just typing in IDENTS, is the way most people create a flight plan. And I mentioned before that that's based on how you set up your own defaults, like it defaults to Victor Airways. If you don't want to do that, or it defaults to VFR flying, if you're an IFR pilot, you probably want it to default to IFR. Great. So that gear icon right above where it says Monday flight, that gear icon remembers settings. So we're going to tap on settings and then scroll down a little bit to the flight planning section, which is right here. So we see our pilot profiles, our aircraft profiles, personal waypoints. And then the next one is the interesting one. This is our defaults. So we're going to go into tap defaults. And you, in default, you can type in your home airport, your maximum altitude, your default cruise altitude, plan type like VFR versus IFR, routing method like Victor Airways versus wind optimization or none, whatever you want to do, really easy to do. And then the advantage to doing that is when you go back up to the search box to create another app, it's rather to create another flight plan, it will use whatever settings you have here. That makes sense? You can also do things like you can turn on and off optimizing for best winds. Not sure really why you turn it off, but you can. You can tell it to do altitude change points. What's that? An altitude change point is something that you probably use more often in a printed flight plan. And that means it tells you where the top of climb and top of descent are. Generally on an electronic flight plan, you can use them. If you're doing an IFR flight plan, the system will check for recently cleared ATC routes. We'll talk about that one in the more advanced class. Um, you can translate the weather briefings and add fuel stops. If it's green, it means the option is turned on. If it's white, it means it's turned off. Okay, and remember if you do make a change to hit the save button. So I will, for example, save my takeoff time from now on. It looks like it was set to by default 30 minutes in the future. Let's say I'm, I don't get out of the office as fast as I would like. So I wanna make sure that when I create a flight plan, it takes off it assumes a takeoff about an hour and a half in the future. So I tap save, settings are now saved. Back at the uh, upper left corner where it says settings with a little back arrow, I'll click that and I'm back here. 
All right, so that's how you do a lot of things in uh, changing settings. But I do want to show you also very briefly how to take a look, how to create a flight plan in the plans tab. So we're in the plans tab right now, but we're in the part that displays information about a plan. So towards the top of that, on the left-hand side, below the search box, below where we typed in PAE, PDX, N, there's a back button. It says plans, basically. I'm going to tap on that. And that goes back to a screen that looks a little bit different depending on what device you're on. If you're looking at this in landscape mode, which is to say wider than it is long, which is what we're looking at right now, then on then we kind of do a split screen sort of thing. We put information about creating the new flight plan on the left-hand side, and our recent flight plans that we've created are on the, the on the right rather. So if, for example, I want to scroll down my list on my right side and take a look at a flight that I created for, let's take something a little different, um, NUW to GEG. If I notice that there's an orange marker next to that flight towards the bottom, this is KNUW-KGEG, it says on server, as opposed to the ones at the top of the screen that generally have a green label that say downloaded. What's the difference? Downloaded means that that particular flight was either created on this device or it was created on this device and then download or created on a different device rather, like FlyQ Online or an iPhone or a different iPad, something like that. And then it was downloaded to this device. So now it's ready to go, you can fly with it. The ones down here though that are orange, perfectly viable flight plans, but it means they don't physically exist on this iPad. So if you take off without downloading them, you don't have internet in the plane, so you're not gonna get them. So just make sure that if you plan a flight on some other device and you want to execute it on a given device, that you make sure to download it first. You do that just by tapping on it. So I'm going to tap on NUW to GEG. I have no idea what this is going to be. And you see it pop up, and here's our flight plan. Now, you'll probably notice, though, that the wind speed is zero degrees, zero knots. Hmm, you may think that's a little fishy. I don't think I believe that. Well, it's not. The reason why it displays that is, if you look at the upper left corner, note the time, time, colon, August 20th, 2019, 5.02 p.m. It's a lovely time. Unfortunately, it's in the past. So if you want to actually take this flight, it means you're going to have to tap on that time and change the date. I'm not going to do that because I want to show you what this pop-up does here. This pop-up is really handy. The pop-up, which you can turn off by sliding that show this message again button to off, what it does is it's pointing to what we call the pre-flight checklist. The pre-flight checklist, if you're coming from another application, you may think of as, a, I, I think some other apps call it uh, something like packing or something like that. All it really does, we invented this, we came up with the feature first, and if you tap that button, it looks like an aircraft taking off. What it does is it takes a look at if the GPS is available and basically if all the data that you need along that route of fly, flight is available. And if so, you see things being green. So at the very top of the screen, it says this green button that says no downloads are required. That's great. If on the other hand, we picked a flight plan, like I'm gonna try one just very briefly here. I'll say Boston to FDK, no routing. That's done the search box. And if we were to now take a look at our pre-flight checklist, look at that. Now we see some red. Red, bad, green, good. So this isn't really shocking. It's basically telling us that we haven't downloaded all the data we need for the flight. And it's kind of slick because you can hit the download button on the upper right corner and it will download only the states that are actually along that route, not other ones. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna click the done button in the left corner and next to the icon that we just picked, the one with the aircraft taking off, it's a button that looks like a down arrow. That's our download data button. I'm gonna tap on that. And, oh, that's actually very handy. So green, good, red, bad. So we've downloaded data for uh, the West Coast and for a few places, it looks like Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, and even some of Mexico. But we didn't download all the data for the East Coast. So in particular, we're flying through Pennsylvania. Uh, the magenta line here is our flight plan line, of course. So we begin at Boston and we're flying to uh, Frederick, Maryland. And we've downloaded data for Pennsylvania, so that's great. We didn't download data for New Jersey, for Massachusetts, uh, for Connecticut, and we probably realistically would want Rhode Island too. 
So one of the neat things about downloading data with FlyQ, as opposed to most other apps, is that you don't have to have an alphabetical uh, listing in your mind, or rather be a geography whiz to know what states you fly to, to know what you download. Here, you just say, great, I need that state, I need that state, that one, that one. And although if I look really closely, I'm not actually going through Rhode Island, close enough. Let's select it anyway. Now, if I hit update now, what the system will do is it knows not to bother downloading the green states because they're green, they're already downloaded. It'll only download the states we cross here. Now, uh, just to be really clear on this, if this flight plan did, we just barely go through New York. If we were to modify the flight plan a little bit, well, kind of unavoidable, I suppose. But let's say that we somehow managed to avoid New York and we don't really technically need Rhode Island. If instead of downloading data from here, I'm gonna go back now to that pre-flight checklist, the thing that looks like an airplane taking off at the top. Here, it'll still give me reds because I haven't actually downloaded anything new, but it won't download states that are not directly along our flight path. So if we had, for example, selected Kansas or Missouri or something like that, it would know only to download the states along the East Coast that it needs to execute this flight. And even if other states were selected and expired, it won't bother downloading them because you don't need them for this flight. So that's the difference in what the download button here does, as opposed to, I'm gonna close this, go back to the data manager. If I hit update now, it will, if I did download Kansas and Wyoming or whatever it is. See, I had already downloaded data for Kansas previously, even though it wasn't selected, but I've never downloaded the data for Wyoming or maybe South Dakota. So if I hit update now, it's going to download the data for all of the red states, even the ones that are 1500 miles away from my flight. So that's kind of the difference here. Okay, final thing, we have a couple more minutes. So I do wanna get into what it's like to create a flight using, um, again, the plans tab. So I'm gonna go back to my list where I see my new flight plan on the left-hand side of the screen. This is more like a, kind of like a database thing. You have a pick list. Instead of typing in just where you wanna fly, you pick different routing options. So routing, I can choose between the one where it wind optimizes and added fuel, but does nothing else. I could do terrain avoidance. I can even do search and rescue, but we won't do that today. So let's just keep it to maybe, oh, I don't know. Yeah, let's keep it Victor Airways, fine. There's a from button. So the from button, you may remember when we set up our defaults, we told it what our default airport was in the SIS airport. If we've taken flights from other airports, though, we can hit the blue recent button next to it. And it shows us, looks like we've done ones from CLM. And same thing on the two. You can type in an ident if you want to, or you can hit the recent button. Because most people fly to kind of the same airports very, fairly often. So we'll pick Boise, maybe. And you can add waypoints in the middle by typing that in. Just put spaces in between for all the types. Pick VFR versus IFR. So pick her down here. So maybe make this one an IFR flight. And then you get choices for things like adding fuel stops or showing those optimize or optimizing for best winds and so on. Now these are kind of the basic options. These are the ones that most people use most of the time. And they're the only ones I'm gonna talk about right now. But you notice that there's actually a button that's labeled more. If I tap on the more button, you get, shockingly, more options. So when you tap on more, you can change the time, you can change the pilot, you can change the aircraft. So if I wanted to you know, pick a different plane, I can do that. So a lot more options are available too when you do that. For other options that you can use that I'll cover in the more advanced topic, uh, things like setting the des desired cruise altitude. So for example, if you don't tell it to do wind optimization, you can give it a specific altitude. You now try to fly at that. You can give it minimum and maximum altitudes. So for example, you have a plane that can go up to the flight levels, but you have kids on board who you don't wanna go up that high. You wanna stay below say 9,000 feet or 10,000 feet. You can type in a max altitude. You can begin with different amounts of fuel, um, so if you have a lot of people on board and you need to alter for weight and balance reasons, you need to not take off of the full tank, by all means, you can type that in, all kinds of fun things like that. So at that point, I think it's pretty much the end of the presentation for today. Uh, I'm going to give just one little uh, thing that's useful too. Since right now, many, many people are adding ADSB out, you can finally see your tail number on the plane. So I can't actually show this to you because I don't have uh, data running right now, but I'm gonna cheat a little bit. 
bear with me for a second. So I'm going to pull up uh, the Seattle Avionics website. And I want to show you a screenshot of something that you can do. Just tap somewhere here. I'll slow down in a second. I just want to find the screenshot. Okay. All right. So if you take a look at the screen now, if you are flying with an ADS-B receiver, uh, like a Stratus 3 or a Dynon DRX or a level um, Astrolink or, what, or a Stratus or a Merlin or whatever, a Stratix or a Merlin, whatever you want it. When you type it in, when you tie it into the system, you start to see ADS-B displays like this. We color code the ADS-B targets. A couple of things, if you were to tap on one of the targets, um, we give you that display that kind of looks like the colored gumballs. It gives you a good sense of which planes, not just a near you laterally, but which planes are above or below you. And they're all color coded so you can tell them apart. You can tap on a colored ball or you can tap on its tail number in the list and it shows you a lot more detail about it. It also means if you take a look at all the little black squares, you see their number like on the left hand side, all by itself, it says plus 25. That means that that particular aircraft is 2,500 feet above you, plus means above, minus means below, and its tail number is listed there too, N297 Papa Alpha is right there. Finally, you'll notice that one of them is it's clipped a little bit, but you notice right above the pop, right below the pop-up, you see negative six next to it. Negative six, is that plane is really close to you, so we begin to color it in orange. Also, there's a plane next to it that's blue, the N4166 Hotel, which is negative, um, which is 3,500 feet below you. Why is it blue? What does that mean? Well, the kind of aqua blue here means that that's one of our friends. That's one of our buddies. So we went into FlyQ settings, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. We actually typed in our buddy's tail number, and whenever that person is flying, he gets his own special color, so it's highlighted. So I'm going to go back to the product for just a second and show you just one last thing. I'm gonna go into settings, which means hitting the uh, button at the top here. So give me just a moment. All right, so settings is on the screen. I'm gonna go down to the section that talks about devices. And there are two things here I just want you to take a look at. One towards uh, roughly the middle of the list, below all the green things, below all the uh, green switches, it says tail number to ignore. If you have ADSB out, what you do is you tap somewhere on that line that says tail number and you type in the N. So let's say that your aircraft is N45 Quebec Whiskey. Type that in. And now what they will do is it will not show that tail number. When you see, when the ADSB feed comes in, the system FlyQ will go to not display that for you. So you don't see a shadow of yourself. I mentioned if you have ADSB out, because if you don't have ADS out in your plane, you're not transmitting your tail number to the ground. Therefore, they can't send it back up in the data feed. Therefore, we cannot mask it out. This is why if you fly and you don't have ADS out, or if you haven't typed your tail number into the system here, what ends up happening is you may see a shadow of yourself, and that's no fun. The other thing is a line just below it, that buddy list I talked about. The buddy list, you can type in more than one here. Uh, you just separate them with a space or a comma or a semicolon or whatever you like. So if you had five friends, type in their tail numbers, including the N. So N45, Tango, Delta, whatever it may be. N34, um, Hotel, Romeo, whatever it is. And now whenever those two planes are seen by the system, it will color them in blue for you. Okay. At that point, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I understand that it's getting a little late for people, especially on the west coast, on the east coast rather. So I appreciate you showing up here tonight. I'm going to leave the presentation running for a little bit in case there's some people have some questions. We'll continue answering those as we go along, but I'm going to sign off and I'd like to thank you very much for spending the night with me. For Steve, for Steve Podrachik, which is me, uh, for Seattle Avionics, I'm Steve Podrachik. Have a good night. Thank you.